Good afternoon. How are you? Well, uh, Thomas Jefferson's weather report is much better today. <laughs> Although it's, uh, it's late and uh, it's in the early evening, actually. The uh, temperature the last time I was out and spoke to you was uh, 94 or, and higher. And now it's 84. So that's an improvement. And there is a wind out about five miles an hour. And so uh, it's pretty comfortable. And then where I walk... There are a lot of trees shading you from the sun, so that's worth a degree or two. And the humidity is not as high as it was. It was like a steam bath uh, just yesterday. So that's where we are. I have been struggling to find constructs, if you will, that describe where we are and how we're at great risk and suffering chaos. And I think a way to take the temperature or to measure where we are is to think about how we memorialize what we find praiseworthy. An insight, for example, showing wisdom or uh, suggesting a course of action. The action itself. And we memorialize something that's heroic in its proportions or in its historic effect. Now, do we have anything like that going on now? I take great solace from the men and women who, for example, gave witness to our former president, the number one criminal in America right now for his gross misconduct, for the findings of various bodies, Mr. Trump. Men and women gave witness to his presumption to usurp our government, its values. Men and women fought to save the republic literally, at least to defend members of Congress, and some died. So we have a, a special situation here, and it goes a little bit like this. The person who has confounded us deserves no memorialization. He's done nothing that anyone can point to objectively and fairly that has amounted to anything except pain and suffering. You could talk about COVID. You could talk about jousting with the dictators of the world. You could talk about compromising the alliance that we had with NATO. You could talk about racism in America and the failure to do anything. You could talk about criminalizing every person who's brown, who comes from south of our border, here seeking asylum, and as Trump characterizes them, they're criminals. And so what are we doing? We don't want to mix their blood with ours. Now, in my own family, there's a man, Jack, and Jack, he was... Hispanic. He's from Peru. He fled that area because, though the youngest, the family wanted to do away with him because when his father died, he left the property to him. And he came to America. It was during the time of World War. And he was told that if he signed up, he could become a citizen. And he did. Jack is the image to me of who comes across that border and what they do and why they do it and how we recognize them and how we recognize their virtue and their efforts to become a citizen. This is light years away from any aspect of Trump's person. You can't say character. I remember in high school, I think one of the words we studied was 
personality, the sum total of everything about you. It's kind of a neutral. But the sum total of everything about Trump is contrived and selfish and self-centered and dangerous and hateful. And it cannot be depended upon. So, for example, let's take those people that should know him the best. There are Republican leaders approaching the convention who have talked about getting rid of Trump as the nominee and staging a floor fight to that effect. And when the Trump people got a hold of this information, they did what they could to tell these people they'd kick him out of the convention if they persisted, and supposedly they folded their tent and gave up the possible demonstration. Trump is right now claiming to have in his mind who would be his vice president, as if that person could possibly be a good choice for the nation, given the requirements and lack of character of Trump. Now, my, well, my gambling sense, and I'm not much of a gambler, is to be amused by Rubio, Senator Rubio in Florida, who's been mentioned as one of the narrowing number of whether it's four, three, two, that Trump knows who they are and he's going to announce it at a time when he thinks it's suitable. And Rubio, since he's from the same state as Trump, if identified, would have to move. He would have to set up residence in a different state because the Constitution doesn't allow the president and vice president to come from the same state. I think that Rubio bothered Trump a great deal, maybe more than others, despite the exchanges about the size of their hands. And I think that Trump keeps him in the mix as kind of a punishment. Now, if he chooses him, obviously all bets are off. Like I said, I'm not, not a good gambler on these things. But trying to read the kind of infantile choices and vengeful ones of Trump, that sort of fits who he is, don't you think? So Trump has confused persons and language such that sometimes it seems he thinks he's talking in tongues, except they're gibberish. They're word salads. They make no sense. A comic, even, wouldn't find them amusing in the sense of the point of a joke has to be communicated. And if you appear to be a clown, then you're a clown. And that's a legitimate entertainment role for people to play, but not one who thinks he wants to be the president of the United States. So Trump has said all sorts of things that are not understandable. And one of his shining examples that we've all seen is him demonstrating a fear of sharks and batteries and talking about how best to die. Frost, is it Frost that talk about dying by heat, fire, or ice? And so there's no posy, no rhythm in Trump's fears, and there's no explanation that makes sense why he would share it. So Trump and Biden will be speaking Thursday. And I've had this uh, thought as I'm walking along that we know that Trump is going to give us nothing worth memorializing on Thursday. All the talk is about what he'll do and whether he prepared or not. And the public, a large part of it, seems to be fascinated by that show without regard for the fact that we're literally talking about our own government. 
and what we can expect from it in terms of rights and wrongs. So when the debate happens on this Thursday, the question is, how did Biden do, irrespective of Trump? Because Biden is our president, has demonstrated that he can do the office. Sure, we have disagreements. I have disagreements with him. But overall, I think he's made a contribution, starting with the fact that in 2020, he beat this man, Trump, who's proven ever since that that was a glorious success. But Biden can't just win this election, as I think he will. Biden has to tell us what America is about, what it's worth, what it's worth to us as a nation, as citizens, what it means to the rest of the world. Because nothing less than that is at risk here. Nothing else is at risk. You know, we have uh, the comparison of a man who's been found responsible for so many things. And the question is, is Biden up to the challenge to show this nation and the world that our government, our original promise is at risk, but he's up to the task and he's not there to clown around. And whether we agree or disagree with his individual policies, the most important ones, including barring the door to Trump, are the ones that should earn our vote. And people who are double haters, and I read profiles from focus groups as to who they are. Well, yeah, you could say in kind of a egotistical way, I'm not going to vote. But in this election, it really matters to vote. And I suppose the closest for the double haters to come to using the franchise to good effect in a nation at risk is to say that I have to vote for Biden because I can't vote for Trump. I have much more enthusiasm than that. It's not just the State of the Union. It's not just his original speech about Charlottesville. It's that this man has had life in the business of politics. And some might say that may narrow the field. But it also gives him a value system that Trump doesn't have. It gives him a value system that is absent in America. And that the chaos is because we lack direction. We lack the idea of a nation. And we lack where we're going. What is our future? What's the future in Trump? The future in Trump may be camps for some, false prosecutions, further loss of liberty. And with Biden, well, I think he's an open book because he hasn't ducked those questions. He hasn't only said what we like, but he hasn't ducked those questions. So Holly and I actually disagree from time to time. So if a husband and wife can disagree, we can disagree with our president. So I, uh, I say goodbye to you uh, until tomorrow, perhaps, depending on the weather. In, our, in my cathedral of open fields right here. And I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.